Matthew uh, chapter 16, in the word of the Lord God, amen. 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 Hallelujah, verse 15, he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Say, upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. Notice the keys of the kingdom. Of the kingdom. Not to the kingdom. Because he don't own the kingdom. God owns the kingdom. So I give you the keys of the kingdom. Of heaven. You know if you give the keys to somebody. You're giving ownership to them. But what's happening here is giving the keys of the kingdom. Amen. Praise the Lord. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Amen. Amen. Then charged the disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Uh, Then from that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, the rock of stumbling. So we have a good stone, amen. And we have a bad stone now, right, amen. Amen. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, a stumbling stop, a stumbling stone. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the, those that be of what? Amen. Men. Verse 1, chapter 17. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, his raiment was white as the light. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter, here he is again, and said unto unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were so afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And then they come down out of the mountain. Jesus rebukes the devil, verse 18. Jesus rebuked the devil. He departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to set apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. Right now we ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. God, we stand with assurance and awareness of your spirit, your presence among us and in us. We ask God that you would have your way today, this morning, in this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Again, the title of the message is Rocks and Mustard Plants. Praise the Lord. So we see in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus uh, gives us a promise that he will establish the church in the future and Peter has a revelation as to who Jesus Christ that he is the Christ the son of the living God that means that he is God come in the flesh so Peter has that revelation Jesus looks at him and says you are a a chip off the old rock you are Peter you're Petros a chip off the rock but upon this rock I'll build my church that means the big rock which is Jesus Christ who he is and his work 
he would build that church. Amen. Amen. And he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So what that means is that the church is on the offense. And what God is saying is that when he builds his church, his people that are in him, amen, related to him, born again believers, this church will become so powerful that the gates of hell will not prevail. That means that the church of the living God is not on the defense, it is on the offense. And so the picture is that we will literally charge the gates of hell. And he was standing there when he said this in Caesarea Philippi. We're at the foot of Mount Mount Hermon. Literally, there was a gaping cave that was called the gates of hell. And there was a river that went down into the underworld they called Styx. So when Jesus made that statement, he was standing right there and probably in front of the gates of hell. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Amen. Which means you're going to become so powerful that you're going to literally charge the gates of hell and bring hell to its knees. You are not on the defense. You're on the offense. Amen. I know sometimes the devil wants to make you run. No, no, no. That's a lie from the pit. I'm on the offense tonight. I'm not running. I'm not on the defense. I'm on the offense. And you are too. We're charging the gates of hell. The devil is afraid of you. You shouldn't be afraid of the devil. The devil is afraid of you. You are so powerful that when you make advances toward the kingdom of darkness, the the, the devils have to bow. They have to go to their knees. Hell has to go to its knees because you understand the church is so powerful powerful that everything the devil tries is to raise up by way of resistance it will not stop the church from doing what God has called it to do there's nothing the devil can set up by way of a defense that will hinder the work of God you go after hallelujah you pursue demons you bring them down you defeat them by the power of the name of Jesus Christ hallelujah give God praise in the house Because the church is built upon who Jesus Christ is and his finished work. Amen. Now Satan began to speak shortly thereafter through Peter. The only way that this could happen is if Messiah goes to the cross and dies and establishes that church. But Satan began to speak through Peter. He gets fleshly. He gets carnal. And he says, be it far from thee. Let these things happen unto you. And so Satan now is speaking. And he has literally, Peter has literally, he has yielded his mind and his vocabulary to the devil. On the one hand, he gets a revelation from God. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That revelation comes from the Spirit of God. And when he speaks, he speaks under the unction, having heard the voice of God. Now he yields his mind and his vocabulary to another spirit and he speaks what the devil says to speak he yields his tongue his vocabulary his mind to the words of Satan it is important for us to understand that the voice that we listen to and believe amen praise God is extremely important do you understand that today so praise the Lord stop listening to the voice of the devil And listen to the voice of God. And speak the words of God, not the voice of the devil. Say praise the Lord, church. To do so, we must have our faith in the word of God. We must be grounded and rooted in the word of God. We must be living by the word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Faithful to him. So I might be moving too fast. I've got a check in my spirit, but I hope you get what I'm trying to say. It all depends on who you're listening to this morning. If you're listening to the voice of the enemy, what you're hearing, you're going to say. Amen. But if you are listening to the voice of God 
and embracing that by faith, nothing can bring you down. Nothing can defeat you. The gates of hell will not prevail against you. Praise God, church. Amen. You have time. Go and listen to a message. Uh, Sister Lori uploaded a message. It's called The Demonization of Christians. Recently uploaded on iPod. The Demonization of Christians. And it will impact your life, I assure you. Because in that message we talked about the Western world always approaches things from the natural. It looks at everything naturally. It doesn't really uh, take into a lot of account the spiritual world. It's all natural. If we get sick, we run to the doctor instantly. We don't, a, lot of, a lot of times we don't pray, you know, we don't pray for people to be healed. We go straight to the doctors, you know. And everything that we go through, we look at it from the natural viewpoint in the Western mind. But in the Eastern mind, they don't. They look at the supernatural, the spirit world first as to what is causing the problems in their life. It is only the Western world that looks at it from a Western world mindset that looks at everything from the natural point of view, not the supernatural. So that the natural to the Western mind is the reason why you're having your problems. In the Eastern mind, it's not that way. It's the supernatural spirit world that is creating the problems in our lives. Give the Lord praise tonight. We covered a little bit of that last week when we preached on demons. But that message she uploaded is so powerful it will change your life because it will show you just how often that the spirit of the enemy is coming and he's trying to disrupt what is going on. But remember, you are on the offense. And you can take authority over those principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness and heavenly places. You can defeat them by the power of the name of Jesus. You're cleansed by his blood. You crucify your flesh. And you cast out devils by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If you're having problems in your mind today, I will tell you it's not just natural. It is spiritual. Give God praise in this house. And and we talked about the kingdoms of the end times uh, that will be seen in the book of Revelation in that one conglomerate beast. Amen. You with me today? You have the Babylonian kingdom in that representation in Revelation 13. You have the Medo-Persian representation. You have the Grecia uh, representation. And you have also the Roman uh, representation in that one beast. You have to understand when you look at it. Don't look at it just from a natural viewpoint as to what that means in a geographical, natural point of view. They all represent spirits that will be fought by the church in the last days. Give God praise in this house. And so not to teach that this morning, but you will hear that understanding in the demonization of Christians. If you'll listen to it, it'll change your life. Give God praise in the house. We, we talked about so many things, about sickness and, and curses, uh, generational curses and, and financial poverty-stricken things that come to your life. We talked about sexual problems within the marriage. Oftentimes, we just look at it from a natural viewpoint, but it's a spirit that comes to make you poor and to make you sick and to break up your marriage by causing problems in your uh, sexuality because when your sexuality is disturbed, your whole being is disturbed because you or your sexuality inside of you is so powerful. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It is such a powerful thing that the devil knows if he can disrupt the sexuality in you, he'll disrupt your whole being. So you have to understand the way the devil comes. He seeks to come and disrupt your marriage in the area of sexuality because if he knows if he can do that, he'll mess your whole being up. Because he even knows how powerful that urge that is inside of you. Give God praise in this house. So once again, I come to you today to remind you that you are in a spiritual battle. That comes against you, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Look at your neighbor and tell him you got everything you need to be victorious. Hallelujah, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And so last Sunday night, we, when we were praying, we prayed over so many things that I don't even remember that we have talked about in, in that particular service as well. Uh, we prayed for people who are dealing with financial problems, 
people that were dealing with burial problems, hallelujah, to the land. All kinds of things. God was hitting, hitting it last Sunday night. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise in this house. Thank you, Jesus. But we're not whipped. We're not defeated. We are victorious. And the prayers that were prayed and the word of God that was preached brought deliverance to many people's lives. I've got testimonies through the week about how God stepped in and did powerful miracles. Hallelujah. In the spirit and gave them help and strength uh, in the time of their battle. So when you get time, you might want to listen to that. That was preached in 2004. And it'll read your mail. It read mine. And I thank God for it. Praise the Lord, church. Give the Lord praise and worship. But today I'm going to preach something this morning that's going to help you. It's going to encourage you. Amen. Say praise God. You are born again believers in Christ Jesus. And he is the foundation of the church of the living God. And you're on the offense and the gates of hell cannot stand against you. I will say it again, no matter what resistance comes up. No matter what hindrance he seeks to place in your life. It can be overcome. But you must be consistent. You must be deliberate. You must be patient. Say, give God praise in the house. You must never quit. You must hold on to the end. You must walk in the spirit. Say, praise God, church. And if you do, you will be victorious because you're a part of another kingdom, not the kingdom of darkness, but the kingdom of light. Jesus, the Bible says in the 17th chapter, goes up in a mountain apart to pray. In Luke, the Bible tells us in the ninth chapter that he goes up into that mountain. In Matthew, it doesn't say that he goes up there to pray. In Luke, it says he goes up there to pray in that mountain. He takes Peter, James, and John with him up into that mountain. And he begins to pray. Why is he praying? Well, the context tells you that when Moses and Elijah appears to him, they, they are talking to him about his decease, about his need to go all the way to the cross and die for us. Amen? Amen. To not listen to the voice of the devil that says you don't need to go to Calvary, but listen to the voice of God that says, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. God is saying, I am pleased with what you are doing here, son. You're going to go to the cross. You're not going to give in to the voice of the devil. You're going to be willing to go and die on that cross to save humanity. So I am well pleased. But the reason why Jesus went up in that mountain to pray in that night season was so that he could be absolutely sure that what he was doing by way of going to the cross was in the will of God. And when he goes up there and he seeks the mind of God concerning the future, going to the cross or not, that's when he has sent Moses and Elijah to strengthen to help him to understand that he must go to the cross. They speak of him, to him of the decease. Amen. But the Bible tells us something very interesting. It tells us that while he is there in that mountain, having prayed concerning what the will of God is, something begins to happen in his being. The word that is used in the Greek is metamorpho. Metamorpho. We get the term metamorphosis. And that means that his form began to change while he was standing in that mountain. I don't know what this means totally. I don't, understand. I don't know if his body was becoming spiritual if, it was, if we were moving from flesh to spirit, I don't totally know what was going on. I just know that his body began to change. It was as if he was fixing to go into an eternal state, a resurrected state, or a glorified state. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 9 that he could have been received up to heaven at that time. But instead, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. What that means is that he had already finished his probationary period of time on this earth. He was born as a perfect man. He was born as an innocent man. But he became holy and righteous after being tested by the devil. So having been tempted by the devil and lived his life, now he can be changed and transformed. He could have been received up to heaven in that moment. 
What he is showing you is this is the perfection of humanity. This is what would have happened to every one of us if Adam had not fallen. Satan comes to Adam and even the garden. Uh, and we know the story that Adam falls. He falls into sin, plunges the human race into sin. At that point, instead of becoming righteous and holy, he becomes a sinner. Adam was created perfect. Adam was created innocent. He could have become holy and righteous if he had not yielded to temptation. I'm going to say it again. Adam was created innocent, would have become holy and righteous if he had not yielded to temptation. He was not, cre- he was not created holy. He was created innocent. It was only after he was tested, tempted by the devil, that he fell and became a sinner. If he had not fallen into sin and given into sin and walked the path of the sinner, having been tempted and tested by the devil, he would have experienced the same thing that Jesus did at the Mount of Transfiguration. After a period of time on this earth, his innocence, having been tested and tempted and overcome, he would have become transformed as a holy, righteous man. Not just innocent, but holy and righteous. But he did not take that path. He took the path of the sinner man. Amen. Amen. Jesus comes into the world and he lives a perfect life. He's tempted of the devil. When he's tempted of the devil, he doesn't give in to the temptation. And so having been tested and tempted now, he is a perfect man, an innocent man that was born. Not created, but born. He's the only one that's ever been born an innocent man. But when he's tested and tempted and he overcomes that, now he becomes a holy and righteous man. And at that point, he could have been received up, which would have what have happened to every one of us if the fall had not taken place. You would have lived here in this life, been tested and tempted, etc. Praise God. And if you overcame that, then you would become holy and righteous and your body would begin to change. And you would be taken up to heaven and, and planted in the heavens. Give God praise in the house. So Jesus now, as the holy and righteous man, having been tested and tempted by the devil, he begins to be transfigured before them. That means to be metamorphosized. He's going through a change, but he stops it from happening. What you see is a perfect perfect man standing there, uh, uh, moving into a glorified state, but he stops it from going any further because he knows that he has to die at the cross. He could have been received up. That means he didn't have to die. That also means he did not have to die to get out of this world. He could have got out of this world with not having having died because he never knew sin. He was tested and proven and tempted and overcame the temptation of the devil. And so now he is being transfigured before them as a perfect man, getting ready to be taken up into the heavens. Hallelujah. But he put it to a stop. He stopped the metamorphosis process because he knew he had to go and die on a cross in order to save you and me. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And the glory was in him. We can now experience by his salvation work. Now I know I'm going real fast, but I've got a lot to cover this morning. Hallelujah. So having prayed concerning the will of God, he's now transfigured before them, but he puts it to a stop. He doesn't get translated into the heavens. He's got to go to the cross and die for us. So we see, amen, in verse 2 of chapter 17 of Matthew, he was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun. His raiment was white as the light. And remember, this has happened at nighttime. So you can imagine how amazing this would have been after a time of prayer. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto them, unto Jesus. Now watch what Peter says. Lord, it is good for us to be here. I'm going to say it again. Lord, it's good for us to be here. Amen? Amen. The implication is, don't go to the cross. You understand? Now watch this. Watch what happens here. We don't, you know, you don't need to go to the cross. Let us build three tabernacles, one for you, Moses, and Elijah. Now where is he standing? 
at the foot of the Mount Hermon where the gates of hell are located. And on that mountain are all kinds of shepherd, uh, shelters to all kinds of, of demonic spirits, false gods, philosophers, men who claim to be deified. Shelters all over that mountain. Dedicated to so-called men that men worshipped in that day. 